Welcome home, my little hellhounds. Tonight we have three scary stories to sink our hellish teeth into. If you have any scary stories you want narrated on the channel, then submit them to reddit r slash home of scares and follow me on Twitter at home of scares. Also, if you like this content, then don't forget to subscribe and click that like button. And don't forget the bell icon so you get notified every time I upload. Now, let's get right into it. The time a creepy neighbour tried to stab me. Posted by Funfetti Dragon. This happened in 2008 when I was nine years old. I lived in a town home community where each road had two sides of homes. In between the backs of the houses there was a back road with alleyways that went in between each building section. I lived on the edge of one of these and my town home was on one of the alleyways. I lived on one street and across the back road on the opposite side lived an elderly woman whose name I don't even know. I am not sure what her situation was but for whatever reason she never liked me specifically. She was creepy and spray painted all of her windows so no one could see in her house. However, that never stopped her from sometimes staring out her bedroom window directly at mine and keeping it open at night to shine a red strobe light into my room across the way. She used to yell how she hated us. I was in fourth grade and on a particular January morning I had unfortunately missed the bus. My dad sent me outside to get in the car so he could drive me and he said he'd follow me out soon after. As I was walking to my dad's car she came out of the alleyway next to my house. Slowly with a gigantic kitchen knife behind her back. She raised it and started running after me. I was faster than her, so I was able to avoid her and was able to get into the house. She walked and stood on the neighbor's porch across the way and stared at my house. I was terrified. My dad ran out and yelled at her and she said she wanted to get rid of us stupid kids. My parents called the police but the police sent her home and had an ambulance come and pick her up later. My parents went to some kind of court meeting about it but I don't really know the details. I didn't see her again after that until one year later. I don't remember the day, but it snowed that morning, so I was going to run out of the front door and play in the snow. I opened the door to see her standing on the porch, but looking out towards the road. I panicked, closed and locked the door. I ran up to my parents' room and told them what happened and we saw her walk off the porch up the street. I never saw her again after that. My family has since moved far away from there, but people I know say she still lives there. 
and her windows are still the same spray painted windows though it doesn't affect me as it much as it used to I still don't like being around knives My McStalker, posted by Warped Leo. This took place a few years ago when I was 16 female. I will admit that I was young and naive and tended to believe that I would never met anyone that would wish or do me any harm as I grew up in a very small town where everyone knew each other background. The stalking was around eight months long. It all started on my first day of work at McDonald's. I don't really remember anything unusual for that shift except for meeting my stalker and our conversation, which I will refer to as D. For some context, D was 26 male at the time that this took place and he happened to move to the town I live in about a year before I met him. So no one in the town knew much about him. As I was saying, it was near the end of my shift when D came up to me to introduce himself as he was one of my co-workers. The first thing that D said to me was, I know your name is warped Leo but I don't know your age I replied back that I was 16 he then made a few remarks about how I looked more mature than 16 which I awkwardly laughed off as I have never been in a situation like this and I also wanted to build a good relationship with the people I'm working with after those awkward remarks, he tried making more conversation with me while hovering around me and watching me restock items from the front counter area. He told me that he was 26, but that mentally he was 16 and that he moved here because he was running from the police, which should have been major red flags to me to just ignore him and not continue the conversation. However, I gave him the benefit of the doubt that he was just awkward and it couldn't have been anything serious as he lived here almost a year and the police haven't gone after him. After I finished restocking, I clocked out and waited at one of the tables in the lobby for my mum to pick me up. Dee followed me to the table and began asking me for my number as he enjoyed talking to me. Luckily, I had enough common sense to tell him no and that I didn't feel comfortable giving a guy that was 10 years older than me my number. He kept begging for my number after I told him no. So I told him if he guessed my number, he could have it. He surprisingly agreed to this and proceeded to try to guess my number until my mom showed up. Once I got home, I took a shower and started playing mobile games on my phone when all of a sudden I get a text message from an unknown number. It said, hey, I enjoyed talking with you. Do you work tomorrow? I replied back, who is this? It's D. Um, how did you get my number? Oh, I saw it on your application. How did you see my application? 
it was just sitting out on the manager's desk. Oh. I then blocked him and started to realise that D is a little creepy. The next shift that I worked, D was also working. As soon as he saw me, he stormed up to me and asked me why I wasn't responding to his messages and calls. I lied and told him that my mum found out he messaged me and that she made me block him. I know that I shouldn't have lied, but he just seemed so angry and I didn't want him to blow up at me. He then asked if we could message on an app that my mum wouldn't know about and I told him no and that we shouldn't have any sort of relationship outside of work because I am 16 and he is 26 and implied that it's inappropriate for him to try to be pursuing any sort of relationship. He became more frustrated and he told me that I was a bitch because he was only trying to be my friend and that he has no friends here. I don't deal with confrontations so I apologised and tried to quietly do my job. He spent the rest of his shift slamming things in the kitchen area and muttering every time he walked past me. From then on he would either act like my best friend or like he hated me at work. I dreaded going to work because of him but it was the only place where I can work that was close to my home as I would either wait for my mum to pick me up or just walk home. On one of the nights that he was pretending to be my best friend he mentioned seeing me walk home and that he followed me to my house to make sure I was safe. He then proceeded to tell me where my bedroom was which the only window from my room led into my backyard and that is just a forest. This is when I snapped because it had been about two months of him being like this and I told him to leave me alone and to stop talking to me. After my outburst he seemed shocked at first but he left me alone for about three weeks or so, I thought. I found out later from other co-workers that he followed me home after my shifts and that he told everyone we were dating but that I was too shy to show my affection for him in public. After those three weeks he called my mom. I'm assuming he got her number from my application as she was listed as my emergency contact and left a voicemail that asked for my hand in marriage and that any man would be blessed to marry me. Of course my mom freaked out and questioned me on who left her voicemail. I don't know why I lied, maybe because I thought I was going to be in trouble, but I said it was just a kid from school playing a prank and she believed me. After that I just ignored D at work and decided that I shouldn't give him any sort of reaction to hopefully deter him from his obsessive behaviour. I also always had my mum pick me up after work and would make sure all the doors and windows were locked after everyone else in my house went to bed. However, ignoring D did nothing and he would just constantly try to talk to me while I was working and he ignored my lack of participation in the conversation. It got to the point where everyone at work noticed his obsessive behaviour with me and my manager pulled me aside one day to talk to me about Dee's behaviour. She told me, that she has been watching Dee's behaviour around me and that she can tell how uncomfortable I am around him. I told her I was uncomfortable around Dee but 
I didn't mention him stalking me because I convinced myself that if I kept my head down and ignored it, that it would just stop. Luckily, that's all it took for her to switch his schedule, so he didn't work the same shifts and she informed other managers so that he couldn't try to swap shifts with other co-workers that had the same shift as me. At first I was happy because I wouldn't have to be around him anymore. However, my happiness was short-lived as he would just show up while I worked and just watch me while he sat in the lobby. The managers couldn't kick him out as he would always order a soda to stay in the lobby as he was a paying customer and we can't kick out a paying customer unless they do something drastic. This behaviour went on for months of him just watching me work until one day he clocked out and never came back. Turns out he got kicked out by his landlord and had moved back to his hometown. I didn't think anything of it and was just relieved that my stalker was finally gone. Until my one co-worker asked me how it felt being in a long distance relationship. I was confused and then she asked me about D. That's when I found out that he told everyone we were dating and that they had to move his shift as co-workers that are in a relationship aren't allowed to work together and that no one said anything because I was supposedly shy about our relationship. I quickly informed her we were never dating and told her about how he followed me and some of his strange behaviour. Shortly after that, every co-worker that thought we were dating learned the truth of the situation and told me the lies he would say about our relationship. Hearing the delusions, he made me realise how dangerous the situation really was. One of the delusions that he had that stood out to me was him planning to propose to me as we wanted to get married and that it would be the right thing to do as I was pregnant with his child. All in all, it was one of the worst times of my life and to this day I always check the locks on every window and door before I go to sleep. So, to my McStalker, let's never meet again. We made too much noise in the library and now I'm the only one left to warn you. Posted by Toucan the Rapper. Shh. Hearing that sound in my local library always annoyed me, especially when it came from one of the librarians. I'm always hearing on the news how libraries are struggling. They should just be thankful a group of young people like my friends and I choose one as our haunt. I live in a medium sized town on the west coast. We're not quite LA but drive a few hours and you're firmly in California. I'm not going to give you any more details than that because I don't want you to come looking. I'll be honest I don't think the reason my friendship group is now me, myself and I is unique to our manifest destiny era. Ramshackle Wooden Local Library. I'm holding out hope 
that it is though. So I'm going to do everything I can to make sure nobody comes snooping around. This is a warning and not an invitation. We started hanging around and eventually in the library last year with the protests and lockdowns traveling into LA or one of the other larger cities didn't have the same appeal. It certainly wasn't an enticing prospect for our parents. So either by parental law or not wanting to drive a few hours just to get your windscreen smashed by a protester. We spent the summer of our sophomore year finding things to do in our sleepy hometown. Since the bowling alleys and cinemas were closed or members only for the time being, the local library ended up being our port of call. There were five of us, me, Jackson, Henry, Beth and Laura. For context too, we were your typical nerdy geek bunch. I'm aware that the library isn't the first choice for many folk my age, but we weren't cool enough to go driving around the desert or find somewhere to drink liquor stolen from our parents. What we were cool enough to do is get really interested in any one of the niche topics found in the old dusty volumes on the shelves. Week one, it was Peruvian horticulture. Week two, the naval advances of the 19th century Holland. We didn't take it too seriously, you understand, and I realize now how dumb it sounds out loud. However, despite how dry these topics may be, I would give anything to have another Friday night PowerPoint showdown at Laura's or hear Jackson tell me about the raunchy extramarital affairs of an obscure architect only famous for designing some kind of bridge in the 1790s. I miss them. It's only been a week but I miss them all so much. It was the evening before one of the aforementioned PowerPoint lectures and pizza evenings that everything went wrong. The topic was the history of um, female satisfaction. Laura had picked the topic for that week and since she was dating Jackson, this made for a lot of jokes innuendo and overexcited teenage whispers and giggling. Shh. The librarian was not happy. Her harsh hisses pierced my eardrums every 20 minutes or so. Genuinely, we did try to keep the noise from our little corner of the maze of shelves to a minimum. There's only so much self-control bored teenagers can exert. However, this is your last warning. After a few hours, we all looked up to see the aging librarian. She was stood above us, arms crossed. Her raising face looked in a scowl. Keep the noise down. I won't be able to tell you again. With that, she stomped off back into the labyrinth of spines and pages. What did she mean by that? Laura said, one eyebrow raised. I think she means, shut up, La, Jackson replied, grinning. That's usually the definition of shh. She gave him a playful punch on the arm, rolling her eyes. I know that, Einstein, but why did she say I won't be able to tell you again. Does she think we're going to go somewhere? That is a weird way to say it, I shrugged. But she is old, like way old. I think she's been the librarian since my dad was a kid. Jackson stood up. Whatever. She should just be happy someone is actually using this place. I'm going to take a leak. He strode off, following the librarian into the dusty gloom. 
he's going to read all the notes he's been making, I'll bet. Henry said, grinning and pointing to the book he'd left on the female anatomy. Laura went red, and we all howled with laughter. It was loud, too loud. What the... We heard Jackson's yell, even above our mirth. In an instant, we stopped laughing. Jackson, Laura called out. Her trembling query was answered as soon as her lips closed. The response came from everywhere, all at once, and it wasn't Jackson. Shh! The voice with, thin and sharp, somehow faint in my ears, but a deafening roar by the time it reached my brain. It seemed to be coming from nowhere and everywhere at once. A homeless sound ringing from the gaps between the covers and unopened pages. A horrible sound, far worse than any reprimand from the librarian. It sounded more mechanical than human, like a thousand typewriters scraping together to make an imitation of speech. Jackson, Beth and Henry both yelled this time. Laura had stood up, fist clenched. Again the hiss rolled from under shelves and out of the floorboards. It was louder this time, longer. It scratched my ears and caused spots of light to crackle at the outermost edges of my field of vision. Beth started to cry, still no response came from Jackson. Jack! Shh! This time I was the one ushering silence. I raised a finger to my lips, the other held in the air, telling the others to wait. As soon as we stopped, so did the noise. One moment there was air, was electric with malicious static, and the next you could have heard a pin dropping, another much smaller pin. We waited for a few moments, not saying a word, I could hear nothing except from the occasional sob from Beth and the thud, thud, thudding of my heart in my ears. Then from the shadow maze of shelves there came a soft thump, like something heavy being dropped to the floor, something or someone. Now, as you can probably guess, my little group of ragtag misfits wasn't what you'd call brave. If we were, we'd have spent our summer. If we were, we'd have spent our summer somewhere much less tame than the library. However, while not brave by any measure, I was the most adventurous of the group. It's the reason I was the only one out of Jackson, Henry and I that didn't get too much hassle from the athletic kids or stoners. Yes, I may not have got into trouble for fights or cigarettes, but in detention they still had respect for the guy that nearly blew up the chemistry lab and hacked the school computers to run Minecraft back in fourth grade. I mentioned this not to brag, but because I don't want you to think I abandoned Laura, Beth and Henry. One of us had to go and find Jackson. After hearing that thump, I was the only one it was ever going to be. They couldn't have moved even if they'd wanted to. And besides, I had no idea what would. Anyway, I gave Laura a nod and put my fingers to my lips again, hoping the message was clear. I slowly crept forwards towards the shelves. A firm grasping at my ankle had me whipping around, ready to run for my life. It was only Beth, sobbing and shaking her head at me slowly. I didn't want to show her I was scared as she looked, so I shot her a grin and a thumbs up. Laura took her hand and continued onwards. I tiptoed between the shelves, 
for what felt like hours. I read once that adrenaline can distort your sense of time, even factoring in the fact that my fight or flight response was in overdrive. I was still walking much, much longer than I should have been. The longer I walked, the stranger and more unfamiliar around me the shelves appeared. The grey steel modular shelves gradually gave way to warped wooden units. The books they contained had odd titles by authors I either didn't recognise or knew by their infamy of literature. The Expendability of Man by H. Himmler Trends in Upholstery and Leatherwork by E. Gein and Lust and Lucrativity My Story by H. Weinstein The fonts on the spines were jagged and odd and after a while the titles paid no attention to punctuation or capital letters some didn't even have an author burn them by a guy ha 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 the children are bleeding a housewife's tale and perhaps most chillingly of all was that was clearly a photo album with dead babies scrawled on the side in dark green sharpie the weirder the books and the shelves got the more the light changed the library wasn't well lit to begin with heavy shutters and decades of dust did a good job of keeping the 24-6 365 west coast sunlight out and the strip lights overhead hadn't been replaced since 1970s at least well the lights that were overhead I should say I looked up when I realised that the ceiling above me and the yellow flickering lights that hung from it had gone in their place there was nothing above me stretched a void of emptiness that faded to inky blackness barely a few inches above the shelves a cloud of impenetrable shadow rolling above this unfamiliar section of the library. However, I was not in darkness. If anything, the place I was in now was better lit than the library. I knew. I glanced down at my hand, holding it above my arm, frowning. I looked down and turned around on the spot, heart rate rising with each shuffling step. I had no shadow, neither did the shelves. Even underneath them was lit as if someone was shining an industrial strength flashlight in every spot at once. It was a harsh white light with no source, one that made things look sharper and more in focus than they should. As I said, I was adventurous and had a rebellious streak, but I was never brave. Beth, Henry, Laura, I called out, breaking my cardinal rule. My voice trembled and cracked. I couldn't feel my bottom lip start to wobble. I'm not ashamed to admit that at all. If anything, I'm proud that I didn't soil myself. J J J Jackson, I stammered. There was no response, not even from the presence that had hounded us just after Jackson vanished. Not that I was complaining. There was nothing but silence. Librarian lady? I hazarded. Still nothing. The silence seemed to press down on me, stifling my words before they could echo further than a shelf or two. I couldn't even hear a ringing in my ears. I could feel my heart pumping in my chest, but I realised there was no rhythmic rushing of blood against my eardrums. I was about to turn and run as fast as I could back to the group, when this place, where no humans should tread, 
decided to respond. I heard it. A few shelves over, an unmistakable wet squelch of something large and organic falling from a great height. Jackson! I'm proud of myself for the fact that, in that moment, concern for my friend's safety superseded my growing terror. I skidded nearly to a crash after hurling myself towards the intersection between the rows. I turned in the direction of the thud, ears simultaneously both straining for further sounds and trying to ignore the fact my shoes were silent on the threadbare carpet. I stumbled into the shelving crossroads just in time to catch a glimpse of something, of someone striding purposefully away down another alley of oddly titled books, an alley that was in the exact direction the sound had come from. I didn't have time to take too many details as I followed, despite my limbs' better judgement. Just a thin leg in dark grey suit trousers, an overly polished black boot and the swish of a dusty dark velvet coat tail. I was relieved, and still am, to have found the bookshelf aisle where the squelch had come from, was empty. Now I know what I'd just chased. I count my blessings that the others must have picked that moment to start making noise. The only reason I can come up with for why. It wasn't waiting for me when I came around the corner. As it was, I was still alone. At least I could see where the sound came from. There was a book laying face down and open on the floor. I'd never seen a book so large or thick in my life. Like somebody had combined three Bibles and a copy of the Quran for good measure. The cover was moist, the reflections from an unseen light danced across its slick surface. As I edged closer, the hairs late puberty had graced me with so far rose, lifted with static generated by a new, inexplicable apprehension forming on the surface of the deep dread. I was already drowning in. I could see that the pages were wet too, so wet they were dripping. A dark puddle was forming around the open tome. If I didn't know better, I could have sworn It writhed every so often. No, not writhed, breathed. It was almost imperceptible, but at regular intervals, the spine rose and fell a fraction of a fraction of an inch. I dismissed the observation at the time, but, well, let's just say the 2020 vision hindsight brings isn't always a welcome thing. Once I was a few steps away, I could see the leather bound volume was indeed leaking an ochre mucus from unseen pores, just enough to give it a coat of foul smelling grease that pulled around it. I didn't have too long to inspect this though. Barely a moment passed between my reading the title and me running back towards the others, with urine between my legs, tears streaming from my eyes, and the loudest scream I've ever mustered, tearing my throat apart. The skin-bound book was called The Sanctity of Silence by Jack Bridger. I only knew one Jackson Bridger, and his voice sounded far too much like the shrieks that followed me as I charged down the impossibly endless rows of abhorrent texts by infernal minds. I must have been running impossibly fast because I found myself back at our corner in only a few minutes. If I wasn't already sobbing, I would have started then. All three had gone. There was, however, another damp, seeping book on the ground This one was smaller than Jackson's, 
and the words scarred into the cover read Volume Control for Dummies by L. Eastley I don't need to spell it out for you, I'm sure. I knew an L. Eastley, Laura. I don't know what compelled me to bend down and open the front cover, probably some twisted counterpart of the same curiosity that led to the bully in chemistry lab incident. The wetness on the leather felt greasy and viscous. A substance that reminded me of both oil and phlegm. That wasn't what immediately grabbed my attention though. The first thing I noticed was how warm the metal was. I know warmth is usually calming, but at that moment it was exactly the last thing I wanted from a book whose covers similarity to human skin. I found it harder to ignore by the second. When the cover fell open and the first page revealed itself, I nearly vomited. It was Laura's face. Well, a picture of her face. I hope. At least her once attractive features, Jackson definitely punched above his weight, were twisted and crushed, as though she'd had her head violently forced against a photocopier. Eyes closed. Nose bent and clearly broken. Lips pressed so hard that teeth poked through bloody wounds around her nose and chin. The picture looked so real, realer than a photograph. I don't know how to explain it, but it looked clearer and more realistic than if she had been stood in front of me. Shaking, my shameful curiosity moved my fingertips across the image of my missing friend. What colour remained in my face, drained. The page was bumpy, rough, although barely. If I wasn't touching it, I'd have had no idea it wasn't flat. It also didn't feel like paper. Paper isn't that soft, isn't that warm doesn't have fine hairs only detectable by the slightest touch. I nearly screamed when I, the light tickle of an eyelash. I didn't even have time to, though the picture of Laura opened its eyes. The next few moments are a blur. I must have dropped Laura No, can't think like that. The book that looked like Laura. Because the next thing I knew, I was in the entranceway to the library. The normal entranceway to the normal library. I was on my backside, covered in tears and urine, and the oily phlegm from that book. But I was in the real world. I was on my ass because I'd just bumped into the librarian. The old woman glared down at me. Shh, she hissed. I was about to wail in protest to tell her something horrible had happened to my friends, that she needed to run when my words caught in my throat. Something dripped on my exposed ankle, something thick, greasy and warm. I felt my gaze slowly pulled upwards to the ancient woman above me drawn with horror to what she clutched between her frail arms. She was carrying two books. Each was bound in a thick leather cover that heaved in and out in her grasps. The faint folds and stretches around her hands, wriggling and twitching too clearly to ignore what made me scream so loudly. They've had to remove my tonsils. However, where the titles, I never found out what Henry's volume was called. Seeing the words, I never told him I loved him. The life and quiet times of Beth Stanford was enough. 
I've never been so glad to feel sunlight. I threw myself out of the double doors before the librarian or the thing she was working for had a chance to punish me for my loud transgressions. As you can guess, it didn't take long for the police, not to mention Jackson, Henry, Beth and Laura's parents, to start asking questions. I haven't been able to answer them. I haven't been able to say a word for a week now. The only reason I'm not a suspect in their disappearance is that the state the local sheriff found me in, by his reckoning, no guilty person would turn up at a police station, coughing up their own blood and covered in every fear-related bodily excretion imaginable. They haven't found any bodies or the books. I haven't written down what happened until now. Nobody in my town would believe me anyway. I wouldn't have done. What I have been doing since then is research. This is why I am begging you to stay away, not just from my library, but any of them. You're probably wondering whose leg I saw before I found the book about Jackson. I still can't accept. Well, yeah, I was wondering the same thing despite the trauma. My curiosity had to know. It was when I found an article in the archives of the local paper from the early 1900s that I got my answer. It was a piece from 1902 titled Local Library Brings Literacy to X Prospector Town. There was a photograph in the article, a photograph of a building I recognised instantly as the same library my friends and I made the grave mistake of haunting. Something in one of the sapphire windows caught my eye after mucking around with the contrast and brightness in Photoshop for a bit. I saw what it was instantly. I knew I was looking at the thing responsible for my friends never leaving that library. It was a person, although it was impossible to tell if they were male or female broad shoulders and wide hips framed an impossibly narrow waist. It was wearing a dark grey suit and velvet overcoat. Vintage by today's standards, but decades ahead of where fashion was in the 1910s. In its spindly arms it held a stack of thick volumes bound in a material I recognised instantly. Well, all except the topmost tome of the stack. That one I also knew I'd seen before. It was the plastic photo album with dead babies scrawled on the side in Sharpie. I didn't have too long to wonder why a figure in 1902 had a photo album or Sharpie. However, the thing's face made me snap my laptop shut and throw it out of the window too quickly to inspect it further. It didn't have a face. It didn't even have a head. Its neck extended almost twice as far as any human's neck I'd seen. It ended not in a head, but in a massive face-sized ear, an ear that was facing something in the room, but turned towards the screen in the few split seconds before my laptop ended up smashed on the porch two stories below. I've not done any digging since then. I don't know, and I don't want to know. I'm currently in the process of starting trauma counselling and speech therapy. There'll also be funerals to attend once they finally give up searching. As I said, this is supposed to be a warning stay away from libraries because in every old photograph of one I looked at in my first therapy session I could clearly see the silhouette of the librarian of the other library waiting in the shadows for anyone 
that disturbs their books and their silence. And that's it for tonight, my little hellhounds. Thanks for listening. If you liked tonight's stories, then subscribe and click the like button. Also, if you want any stories narrated on the channel, then submit them to reddit r slash home of scares and follow me on Twitter at home of scares. Now, good night my little hellhounds. <laughs>